Hello, and welcome to the YouTube channel of Open Doors Metropolitan Community Church in Seoul, Korea. We're a community seeking to live out the radically inclusive love of Jesus the Christ. We're a faith community of the Progressive Christian Alliance and an emerging church of Metropolitan Community Churches. Please join us now for excerpts from the service held on Sunday, October 2nd, 2016. We're taking a bit of a departure from the revised Common Lectionary. Over the next few weeks, we'll be concentrating on the Statement of Faith, which was adopted by the General Conference of Metropolitan Community Churches in July 2016. The excerpts will not really be sermons, but more presentations. There'll be a lot of information to them, so they'll be presented in parts. You're encouraged to pause between the different parts and reflect on the questions presented. Even better, watch them with a friend and discuss the questions together. Now we begin with part one. God, you've created us as sexual beings. Help us to use our sensuousness responsibly that rejoicing in our bodies our imagination and our senses, we may use them to nurture our love, to enhance our delight, and to increase our awareness of oneness with all things. In your many names we pray. Amen. Amen. The first excerpt from the statement of faith that we're going to be considering is from its preamble. And it reads as follows. Metropolitan Community Churches is one chapter in the story of the church, the body of Christ. We are a people on a journey, learning to live into our spirituality while affirming our bodies, our genders, our sexualities. There are many, there are many images there the body of Christ, people on a journey, which goes back to, the, to uh, the story of the exodus of Israel from Egypt. But I want to focus in particular on affirming our bodies, our genders, and our sexualities, because that's, that seems to be the, the, the tipping point, the hot issue that uh, we experience here in Korea. This presentation, I'm calling it our spiritualities, our bodies, our sexualities, and with much thanks to the Reverend Deborah Hafner, who's the director of the Institute of Religious Studies on Sexual Morality, Justice, and Healing. A lot of this is based on an article that she wrote, and I am very grateful for that. So, now unfortunately, Many people are of two extremes when it comes to the scriptures and sexuality. And those two extremes are that the scriptures clearly teach that sex is for marriage and procreation only, or that patriarchy and heterosexism is so infused into the scriptures that it can basically teach us nothing valuable. Now those are two extreme views, and you'll find varying, you'll find every kind of view in between. But I thought I'd highlight those two in particular. And I'm very intentional about using the word, the scriptures. I will, I will do everything I can to avoid using the phrase, the Bible says. Okay. Because treating the Bible as one book is really a mistake. And if you go back to the original Greek, which re refers to the Bible, the original Greek reference is ta biblia, which literally means the books. The Bible is not a book. It's an anthology. It's like a collection of a whole lot of different kinds of literature. And therefore, we're going to encounter 
many perspectives, many voices, and uh, in fact, uh, some of those voices may sound very different from each other. So just that, that I think that's important to, to bring up, very important. Uh, that, 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 that's, that's one of my, that's my starting point with, with the, way I, the way I use scriptures as a progressive Christian. Okay. Quite simply put, humans are created as sexual beings and we are meant to have sex. Okay. If you go back to, to the beginning, the first book, uh, the first scriptural book, the book of Genesis, there are two creation stories, okay. and they are stories. That's another, that's another assumption that I make, that the scriptures are not to be treated as a science textbook or as a history textbook. Uh, there's a lot of story, a lot of myth, and when I say myth, I don't mean things which are false. I mean stories which convey ideas. Okay. That's, 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 that's not a negative, that's, a not, that's not a negative thing. Okay. In the first story it says God created male and female and basically told them to have sex, be fruitful and multiply. And in the second one, God creates a companion for Adam. And just a little thing about the Hebrew there, those of you who have heard me preach about this before, in the, in the original Hebrew, Adam, or as it's pronounced Adama, Adam, Adam, literally means the earthly. Okay. The one who comes from the earth, the Adama. Adam, yes, it's become a, 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 a name in our, uh, in our modern world, but the original meaning was the, the, the being from the earth. And so a companion is made for Adam, and sex is made the central part of their relationship. Therefore a man leaves his mo mother and father, clings to, cleaves to his wife, and they become one flesh. That is part of the original, what well, many people call the original blessing. Our sexuality is part of the original blessing that God gives to us. That's what we believe. Certainly within MCC we believe that. Bodies are good and because we're bodily beings. I know there's a lot of stuff in the new physics talking about how there's dead matter and the, the, the whole world is interconnected and all that kind of stuff. But we still experience our world as being made up of separate physical beings. Okay. So, bodies are good, and physical attraction is natural. Examples there, Rebecca, who was... Isaac and Rebecca. Oh, Isaac and Rebecca, yes. Jacob and Jacob Leah. Jacob and Leah, yes, yes, that's right, that's right. Okay. And, yes... Rachel, and you know, all these things were used, and Joseph, okay, and uh, one of my, one of my favorite songs, Solomon, it's about sex, okay, in fact, uh, Keeping, Keeping Mum, uh, there's a movie called Keeping Mum, which stars Rowan Atkinson, the British comedian, and Maggie Smith, if you know anything about Rowan Atkinson, he is very good at uh, portraying sort of repressed English clergyman. Yes. Yeah. And so he's 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 a uh, he's he's a uh, uh, very he's he's very good at that. He's trying to say, oh, the Song of Solomon is about a man's passionate love for God, or it's about other people have explained it as saying it's really about God's love for Israel, or. Other Christian interpreters are saying, are saying, it's really a metaphor for Christ's love and the, Christ's love of the church. Uh, okay, that's, that's, the, the, those, those are interesting interpretations, but in its basic form, 
the text itself is about sex. And to demonstrate that, uh, it's okay, we can leave it where it is. I've got a reading from the Song of Songs. And would you be willing sure. to help me read part of it? Okay. Okay. I'll, uh, I'll point to the parts. This is taken from the Song of Songs, chapter 7, verses 6 through 14. And it is a back and forth, a series of, 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 of utterances between two lovers. Listener discretion is advised. How fair and pleasant you are, O loved one, delectable maiden. You are stately as a palm tree, and your breasts are like its clusters. I say I will climb the palm tree and lay hold of its branches. Oh, may your breasts be like clusters of the vine, and the scent of your breath like apples and your kisses like the best wine that goes down smoothly, gliding over lips and teeth. I am my beloved's, and his desire is for me. Come, my beloved, let us go forth into the fields and lodge in the villages. Let us go out early to the vineyards and see whether the vines have budded, whether the grape blossoms, blossoms have opened, and the pomegranates are in bloom. There I will give you my love. The mandrakes give forth fragrance, and over our doors are all choice fruits, new as well as old, which I have laid up for you, O oh my beloved. I say again, it's about sex. <laughs> Can't get around it. Okay, the bodily functions associated with sexuality, they are addressed in the scriptures. And they're, they're all there, okay? Uh, the story of Onan, his withdrawal before ejaculation. It is not about masturbation. Okay? It is about Onan not wanting to impregnate the wife of his dead brother. Because the way things went at that time was that if a man died, his brother, would, it, would have the duty of impregnating the wife, but the children would not be his. The children would be considered descendants of his dead brother. And so the story of Onan is, is kind, of a, kind of a warning story about, about how some lines, uh, how, how, how lines of descent can actually be snuffed out. That's what it's really about. Continuing on, when uh, Jacob and Rachel were trying to get away from their father, from, from uh, Jacob's father-in-law, Laban, they took some stuff from his place, including his household idols, and Rachel used her period as a ruse to deceive her father about that. So... There, there are all kinds of Levitical laws concerning emissions and menstruation. I won't bore you with them, but just say it's Leviticus chapter 15. A lot of, a lot of stuff in that. And Jesus, he healed a woman who had irregular vaginal bleeding. And the issue about that if you remember the story, she, she had that irregular bleeding for 12 years, which meant that she was perpetually considered to be ritually unclean. So, it's a breaking of major taboos around that. And pleasure is good. It makes references to Isaac fondling Rebecca. And to, there's a section in there where Rachel and Leah are basically arguing it out amongst themselves. Well, who gets Jacob tonight? And if somebody tells you that BDSM is not in uh, the Bible, refer them to the story of Samson and Delilah. He asks Delilah to bind him. 
three times. And again, don't forget the song songs. It's about sex. So, at this point, I, I don't want to talk too much. I don't, I don't want to, this to be overload for you. Uh, but I've got a couple of questions for you. And it doesn't matter whether this information that I presented today is new to you or not. But two questions that I'd like you to consider. What's your reaction to this information? If it's new, what's your reaction to it now? Or if you've heard this information before, what was your reaction to it when you first found it out? And then the second question, does it affect your view of how sexuality is, or has been, or should be handled in Christianity? Again, we encourage you to pause and reflect on the questions, or discuss them with another person. Now, part two. We're going to the second part of what I'm presenting today uh, on our spiritualities, our bodies, and our sexualities. Uh, relationship statuses. A lot of people talk about celibacy, some, especially in terms of LGBT issues. They say, oh, it's okay as long as you are celibate. Well, that to me is a fundamental misunderstanding of what celibacy is. It's a gift of the Holy Spirit which allows a person to forego romantic and sexual attachments in order to focus on the work of God's kingdom. And it really only becomes an alternative for some people in the New Testament. I mean, if you think about it, in Paul's first letter to the Corinthians, people refer to that a lot when it comes to, when it comes to uh, celibacy. you got to remember, at that time, they were operating under, I guess you could say, a, 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 what they, a self-imposed time limit. They thought Jesus was coming back next Thursday afternoon. And therefore, that impacted how they dealt with, 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 with sexuality and marriage and singleness. Now, in the Old Testament, the evidence appears to be that singleness is only forced by circumstances. We've been reading a lot from the book of Jeremiah recently. When Jeremiah is directed to not take a wife or, or to, to, to have children or whatever, that's because of the impending disaster, you know, the impending fall of Judah from the invasion by the uh, Babylonian Empire. The story of Jephthah and his daughter. Uh, just, I'll just summarize it briefly. Uh, Jephthah was a judge of Israel. This was before they had kings, as the story goes. And Jephthah wanted... Jephthah wanted to, to have victory against a particular pro a tribe when they went to war. And he made a promise to God saying, if you give me victory against this tribe, then the first person who walks through my door, the first person I see after I get home, will I will offer that person to you. And the person who it happens to be is his daughter. So he's made this oath, and he's got to keep it. Now, there is debate among scholars as to whether his, da his daughter ended up being offered as a life sacrifice, or whether she was just kept away from public view. But before that happened, whatever happened, she said, Father, let me bewail the fact that I have not known a man. But I have not had sex. That's part of the story. Sorry, can yeah. I just interject yeah, quickly? Yeah, sure. uh, I think just maybe important to, to note is in, in the scriptures when, when we find the phrase uh, in, in, in English that he has known her or she has known him, mm -hmm. 
90% of the time it's a translation of they had intercourse. That's, that's how it was, how intercourse was described in, in the ancient times. So I think uh, that's just an interesting side note to, to that because yes. be, yes. she bewails she hasn't been known a man and that sounds like, oh, I didn't have any kind of friendship or something, but it actually means no sexuality, yeah. no intercourse. Okay, and as noted there, there are all kinds of relationship arrangements referred to in the scriptures. Okay. Isaac was the only patriarch of Israel who had only one wife. David and Solomon had multiple wives. Jesus chose a Samaritan woman according to the story in John chapter 4, who had been married four times and was living with a guy to tell her village about him. And it does not say in the text, it does not say in the text, go and marry the guy you're living with. That was not a focus of, 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 of the, that story. That was, that was secondary. And, of course, we know the, the, the famous story, Jesus does not condemn the woman caught in adultery. Martha and Mary share their home as sisters. Okay. And uh, in John's version of that is uh, Mary and Martha and Lazarus. Now, this is an interesting one. I've preached on the book of Ruth before. And... Remember that, that if, you, if you don't know about the book of Ruth, it's, it's the story of, of, of uh, Ruth and her, I think it's her mother-in-law, Naomi. Yeah. yeah. And they actually share in parenting their child who becomes either great, who is, who is either the great-grandfather or the grandfather of King David, as, as the genealogy goes at the end of the book. Boaz is the is the one who I, I used to think that, that Boaz was a pretty important guy. Well, he is an important guy in that book, but in reality, he's basically a sire. He is the the person whom Ruth and Naomi use to uh, basically have a kid by. Today, we might think of him as a sperm donor. Now. Here's a good one. My inspiration from this was uh, by a sermon by a professor of preaching who died last year, uh, Fred Craddock, of blessed memory. And his sermon was on the, Paul's letter to the Romans, chapter 16, and it's called When the Roll is Called Up Here. I would, highly, I would highly advise anyone who wants to listen to that sermon to do it. It's, it's, it's a great sermon. But he brings up the fact that when Paul sends greetings to the people in the Church of Rome, he doesn't mention any nuclear families. And really, only one pair is named as a married couple. And he makes that point very clearly. Going on from there, yes, we need to address the elephant in the room, as we say. Okay. Let's get something very clear. In our view, we know lots of churches will disagree with us on this and disagree with us on very passionately. But as far as we are concerned, the sort story of Sodom and Gomorrah is not about seduction into a homosexual relationship. The men of Sodom did not go to Lot's door and say, hey, let's get down, make love. It's about rape. And it's about rape violating the customs of hospitality. If you look at the story, Lot says, this is a terrible thing that you're doing. You're violating, the, these are my guests. Here, here are my two virgin daughters. Go and do with them what you want. So, the text itself is very, is very clear about that. And if you go on, um, actually, yes. I wanted to go back to uh, Ezekiel 16. Okay. When it refers to the sin of Sodom, this was the sin of your sister Sodom. 
that she was rich, but she was unwilling to help the poor. They were so wealthy and opulent. If you look at the references to Sodom and Gomorrah in the books of the prophets in the Old Testament, they do not deal with sexuality. That wasn't their focus. And in the Gospels, when there are references in the words of Jesus to Sodom and Gomorrah, it's about rejection of hospitality. <coughs> Either of the messengers of the, of, uh, that Jesus sends out, or of the more vulnerable members of the Christian community. It's very clear. Yes, Levit Leviticus. Everyone loves to refer to certain parts of Leviticus, about, and they, they love to cling to that. There are two prohibitions on men men's sex. There are ten regulations on sex with a menstruating woman. There are 17 laws on making grain offerings. And everyone says, well, it says that the men will be put to death. Well, uh, apparently anyone who back talks to their parents is supposed to be put to death, too, in the Le 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 Leviticus laws. <laughs> I doubt if, any, if there are a lot of us here who wouldn't be here right now if that were held literally. Yeah. Now, Romans chapter <coughs> 1. The scholarly uh, consensus on this is Paul seems to be re uh, repeating the Jewish evangelism uh, approaches of his day. And they were distinct, where they distinguished themselves from the pagan society. It could be referring to a number of situations, which most likely include temple prostitution. The idea, and, and in fact, many conservative commentators, when they talk about Romans one and First uh, Corinthians chapter six, which I'm going to get to next. <coughs> they, they make that point about <coughs> temple prostitution. Very clearly, we view that, and we view it in that way. Now, in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, Paul makes a list of all the, of all the people who are, going, who are not going to inherit the kingdom of God. And he includes these two terms, arsenokoitai and malakoi. And they are the object of much debate. Okay. In fact, they fit, the, 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 many scholars now believe that arsenokoitai was a word that Paul made up. He coined it. And words that look similar to it actually deal with things like... It, 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 the two parts of the word literally mean man and bed. So it literally means bed man. What the heck could that mean? Well, it could, they had many different meanings. It could have been using prostitution. <coughs> and in that, that day, temple prostitution was, as, as I said before, very common. Temple prostitution is one of the ways in which pagan temples of the day raised revenue. You would have sex with an appointed person in that in that temple, and it was a means. Uh, it was a symbolic way of, of uniting with the god, and it was a way for those temples to raise revenue. And then they get a word from God. Uh, many times there would be, they would go to to find some direction for their life, and after paying and having the sex, then the temporal prostitute will give them a word from God or give them advice about their life. There's also suggestion that our Sinochoitai actually has a financial dimension to it. Uh, so it could be actually forcing someone into prostitution. Pimping, basically. Malakoi has been traditionally referred to as effeminate. And actually, effeminacy in that day was actually 
men trying to make themselves super, super attractive. And it could have been to attract members of either sex, men or women. So that's what Malakoy really refers to. Metrosexual. The metrosexual. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So. Can, I, can I just say something about the, sure. the effeminate men? Um, in the Psalms, I think it's in Psalms, uh, if we go back to the, 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 the Old Testament, then there's parts where, where God says, but when this disaster comes, or when this happens, even the, the most effeminate men among you will cry, uh, will, will cry or, or mm -hmm. something like that. Yes, yes. Um, I think you know the, the piece I'm referring to. Sorry, I'm not very okay. good with verse and I'd have to, exactly. I'd have, to, I'd have to look it up yeah. myself. But what, what's interesting to me is that nowhere in the, the, the Old Testament, the effeminate men are viewed as negative. There's nowhere a, a moral judgment about the effeminate men. They are mentioned. Mm -hmm. But there's no moral judgment no or, uh, or, or comment yeah. about that being made. Right, right. Just about their own society, but nothing negative said about that. Sure, sure. That's yeah. interesting to me. Yes. And there are, of course, examples of deep love between persons of the same sex. Classic example is David and Jonathan. And I'm going to read selected verses from 1 Samuel, dealing with that. So selected verses from 1 Samuel chapters 18 and 20. When David had finished speaking to Saul, the soul of Jonathan was bound to the soul of David, and Jonathan loved him as his own soul. Saul took him that day, David that is, and would not let him return to his father's house. Then Jonathan made a covenant with David, because he loved him as his own soul. Jonathan stripped himself of the robe that he was wearing, and gave it to David, and his armor, and even his sword, and his bow, and his belt. And then from chapter 20, when David is getting in trouble with, uh, with, with Saul. David fled from Naioth and Ramah. He came before Jonathan and said, What have I done? What is my guilt? And what is my sin against your father that he's trying to take my life? He said to him, Far from it, you shall not die. <coughs> my father does nothing, either great or small, without disclosing it to me. And why should my father hide this from me? Never. But David also swore, your father knows well that you like me, and he thinks, do not let Jonathan know this, or he will be grieved. But truly, as the Lord lives, and as you yourself lives, there is but a step between me and death. Then Jonathan, Jonathan said to David, whatever you say, I will do for you. Thus Jonathan made a covenant with the house of David, saying, May the Lord seek out the enemies of David. Jonathan made David swear again by his love for him, for he loved him as he loved his own life. That's one example. Ruth and Naomi, at the beginning of the book of Ruth, there's been a disaster in the land, a famine in the land where they're living, so Naomi is going back home and says to her old daughters-in-law, okay, go ahead and, and go find new husbands in your home and stuff like that. But Ruth will not leave her. And she makes this declaration where you go, I will go. Where you lodge, I will go. I will lodge. Your God will meet be my God, etc. The ironic thing of that is that is often used at straight weddings. You know it. Yeah. That as, as, as you know, the woman being loyal to the man. But this, is, this was actually a declaration of a woman to another woman. That's another example. Now, the eunuchs. In the book of Leviticus, it technically refers to those 
whose genitals were mutilated, cut off, or abnormal. In the Levitical code, they were considered to be unritual, they were ritually unclean, and they were unfit to offer a sacrifice. But again, if you go to the eyes, uh, go to the, to the book of the prophet Isaiah, again, the prophetic code, it says that the eunuchs will have a special place within God's new covenant. You know, it says, you know, the eunuch says, you know, I'm but a, a dry tree, etc., and so on. And the prophet says, no, you will have, you will have your own place within the new covenant community. And yes, and continuing on. Jesus refers to those who are eunuchs from birth, those who have been made eunuchs, and those who are eunuchs for the kingdom of heaven. So... There's a recognition that, that there are a number of different kinds of states of being which are probably covered by the word eunuch. And it could be under the term eunuch, it could also be included, it could also include those who were not attracted to women. And Acts chapter 8 talks about the Ethiopian eunuch. And could very possibly well be the first sexual minority who was baptized within the covenant community. Okay. Again, a lot of information there. Again, whether this information is new to you or not, same two questions. How do you react to this information? And does it affect your view of how sexually, sexuality has been? or is or should be handled in Christianity. Again, feel free to pause and reflect or discuss the questions. Now, part three. And I just wanted to know if with some general, general um, progressive Christian principles that we follow when considering dealing with sexuality and the scriptures. Strike the Bible, put in the scriptures. The simple fact is, we know more about sexuality in this age than was known in pre-modern times. And we cannot discount this knowledge by appealing to selected scriptural verses. You just, that's, that's just improper. Sexuality cannot be reduced to specific sex acts. And the norm, of, and we always try to follow the norm of Jesus. Love God with your heart, soul, and strength. Love your neighbor as yourself. And with those things, we, uh, you know, we can deal with new situations that we did not know about before. I mean, one thing I wasn't, I, I didn't address today, and 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 uh, felt I couldn't address today was was the issue of. of transgender persons. However, these, these same uh, biblical principles when dealing with eunuchs and things like this, I think can also be, can also be applied, the principles behind them can be applied to when dealing with transgender persons. We also know that, we also know now that the, the leading research indicates that uh, persons who are experiencing transitioning to another, when they transition to another gender, the fact is that the chemistry within their brains is actually reacting in what we call a so-called feminine or masculine way. And that may not match with the biological gear that they were born with. But that doesn't, that, that doesn't discount the fact that they experience the world in a particular way, and that needs to be taken into account. So, when Paul was talking, making, was making his, his pronouncements on sexuality, he was looking at it from a very biological kind of way. We now know that chemistry has just as much, probably more, to do with it than biology does. So, 
we have to say that Paul's point of view is limited. And the only thing we can say to those is, uh, who, who may disagree with that is that, you know, this is, this is the, these are the facts. Get over it. So, those are, those are progressive Christian principles which we stand by, uh, both within the PCA and within MCC, when dealing with sexuality in the scriptures. Thanks for watching. We hope you'll continue to watch other installments in this series. We also invite you to participate in our life as a faith community in person. All are welcome to join us in our worship and our ministry. Age, sexual orientation, gender identity or expression, ethnicity, ability, and economic status are not barriers to participation. This is what we mean when we say radically inclusive. We worship at 11 a.m. on Sunday mornings in the Hebangchun district in Seoul. For more information about us, our location, and our ministry activities, please check our website at www.opendoorskorea.org. We hope to see you soon.